Welcome to this episode of the Working Wellbeings podcast. Um, really excited to be back with this second series. I think we're a couple of episodes in, aren't we, Matt? <laughs> yeah, we are. And, yeah, yeah, we, uh, we, yeah, we, we are. are. We are. The episode's in, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So good to be back. I um, hope you've enjoyed what you heard in the first series. And really excited today for both Matt and I to be recording this episode because um, we're kind of divvying it up this series a little bit. Um, so welcome for both Matt and I. Um, and also welcome to our guest for today's pod, which is Natasha Hill. Um, Natasha, hello. So I'm going to leave <laughs> Natasha to um, do a full introduction around her um, role, but she is wow. a police officer and the wellbeing lead for um, Devon and Cornwall um, Police. So Natasha, we're really excited to have you with us today. Um, I think we came across each other, or I came across you, on LinkedIn originally. Yeah. Um, one thing that I'd love you to share today is a bit about the kind of the sharing of the work that you do. And I know that you are a great advocate of the value and role of um, LinkedIn in sharing and celebrating um, the work that you do within the police service. <laughs> Um, with regards to well-being um, but yeah I was just instantly blown away by the way that you share the things that you have been able to achieve with the team that you've got there um, and let's face it potentially possibly on a bit of a shoestring or without big fancy budgets um, the range of topics that you address and the amount of support that you give, as well as your own story. So um, it's just been a really pre impressive um, journey, um, learning about your work just through your sharing on LinkedIn. So it was real joy when you were happy to connect with us in the past um, and share some of your work with us. So really glad to have you on the podcast today with a few questions, um, a little bit of chat. So can we start with just a little bit of a, you know, what is it that you do? What's uh, you know, what's your um, what's your role? And um, yeah, a little bit of an introduction would be great. Of course, no problem. So thank you so much for inviting me. It's really nice to be here. Um, so yeah, I am a police officer, as you said. I've been a police officer for twenty five years. Next month, which is terrifying. Um, and I, but I've only been within the well being world um, formally, officially for the last four years. Um, so I'm part of a team of us of several wellbeing leads. Um, I've got um, a manager who's a police staff member, another manager who's a police officer, um, and then we've got a small team of us who all work very closely together. Um, and yeah, I started um, coming into, I started kind of working within the wellbeing world around 2017. Um, I was in another role, in a strategic role um, within the police and just had a real passion around it um, because my own personal journey which we can go on to talk about um, and I organized a conference our first well-being conference that we had and it was kind of one of those moments where I was talking about things like mindfulness and and things that you, we never ever discussed within the police so it was all very new um, but created a real buzz um, and I kind of put my head above the parapet a bit, I guess, just sort of trying to say, look, maybe we need to look at doing things a bit differently. Um, and then I went in, then I went and started working within the counterterrorism unit, which is obviously completely different <laughs> to wellbeing. Um, and then spent a couple of years doing that within counterterrorism and then applied. They then created a small team of us um, within Devon and Cornwall and Dorset Police um, in 2020. Um, so just as COVID hit, um, there was three of us who started um, new within the post. And we are the only, as far as I know, and I, I've done a lot of work nationally, as far as I know, we're the only UK police force to have a team of us who focus on well-being. Most other police forces have a well-being lead or they've got an inspector who's got it as a, as a portfolio um, or they may have a couple of police staff members. But it's quite unique that that we have invested um, in you know providing staff to work to look after the well-being. We cover um, 8000 officers and staff across Devon, Cornwall and Dorset. Wow, wow! I love, I love that you kicked off with a with a a conference. I didn't know that because I don't know if you know, but that's kind of how Working Well was born as well. We 
had the crazy idea to let's just put a th- so ours was online so let's just do a three-day online conference and sell some tickets and book some speakers and see who turns up really tiring really yeah. tiring oh, how it yours? is <laughs> yeah really exhausting i did another one the week before last actually which is our first one our first well-being in-person conference since 2017 oh. and it happened two weeks ago um and yeah it was really successful and again just created such a buzz in the room it just, you just forget how kind of be, actually being with people and connecting kind of how much you know how much how much of a buzz it creates so it was absolutely fantastic but i was completely exhausted um at the end of it so yeah definitely yeah, absolutely the and, 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 <laughs> I, yeah I, I was gonna say i'm huge we're obviously hugely biased because we run a community but uh, this whole piece around community and you know because the conference is a form of community right it's bringing yeah. people i am absolutely convinced that that is the future of well-being at work yeah. you know that you know it is not simply your interventions and all the rest of it which absolutely is still important but you know that whole piece around just getting people talking about this stuff and communicating to one another and sharing and listening to some well-being related content i think i think that's it right yeah a hundred percent and the feedback we had we had a hundred delegates in the room and then we streamed it online to all uk police forces um and we had about another 200 that signed up to watch it online and then we were able to record the session so um, the feedback that we had was just fantastic. We had people saying this should be mandatory training. Yeah. Um, you know, this is the best conference I've ever been to. The speakers were inspiring. They're incredible. Just, it just went on and on. It was really, really humbling. It was fantastic. Oh, amazing, Natasha. Congratulations. That's a really great achievement. So the, the delegates, are these the um, various personnel that you mentioned before that are kind of holding these well-being lead positions or was it no managers no well? it wasn't it was at, it was open to absolutely everyone so it's really um key for me to make sure we had a really good representation of managers at all levels but yeah. also police staff police officers mm. um different roles different departments obviously it's so vast within our mm. organization you know um and we had a really good cross section of people in the room so um and it was at a stunning venue called Buckfast Abbey in Devon which is um just absolutely beautiful the sun yeah. was shining and yeah it felt like yeah it was such a good day yeah we need to do some more in-person stuff we're working well yeah Yeah. it's inspiring me it's inspiring me yeah yeah, absolutely amazing and so um can we just go right back in a little bit whilst we're sort of at the beginning of the story sort of so to speak about your um you know this obviously has to be something I it sounds to me like this is a passion of yours um and one thing that comes up quite a bit in our discussions with people in positions like yours but also just generally with the community is you know the role of passion um and sort of personal interest in this work right yeah Um, especially when we are doing it you know with limited budgets or um with other big business priorities in conflict potentially um what does role does passion play for you and and your personal connection to this work Yeah, I honestly think it's absolutely huge. I think passion and empathy and creativity are um, kind of really key parts of of being able to do this job really well. And, you know, I talk to people all the time that say that, you know, when I'm delivering training, when I'm talking about it, that that passion comes across, which is, you know, I really hope. And I think that's partly to do with my willingness to be vulnerable and kind of talk about why this is so important to me um so i just to kind of give you some context so i was um i was diagnosed with cancer in 2004 um i was 29 i had a newborn baby and a two-year-old and i'd been in the police about five years at that time um i was really fit and healthy so never ever saw it coming um never smoked in my life didn't drink much was really healthy very boring um, so definitely, you know, didn't didn't see it coming. Um, so completely took my legs from under me. Um, I had chemo every two weeks for six months, lost all my hair, um, you know, went green um, and just had a horrible, horrible year mm. um, and um, was completely terrified of, of of leaving my my daughters. You know, it was mm. just I, at my biggest passion in my life is definitely being a mum to my two daughters Mm. who are now 20 and and 21 Um, but yeah at that time I was just absolutely terrified Um, so got through that was given the all clear after about 12 months 
um, then went through a divorce, sadly, um, and quite quickly after that, then went back to work part time. And then I was working within the child abuse unit. So I was working with children going missing from home and at risk of wow. child sexual exploitation. Um, again, something I was really passionate about. I absolutely loved my job, but it was very, very um, stressful. Mm -hmm. Lots of trauma, you know, talking and supporting victims all the time. So it was really difficult. Um, but I threw myself into my job. I threw myself into being a mum and just thought if I just buried everything and forgot about it, it would all be fine. And I could just, you know, get on and, and look forward. And then in 2015, um, so, you know, just over 10 years later, um, I was sat with a victim that I was working with who was disclosing something really traumatic um, there was quite a lot of pressure um, because there was a, a team out arresting the offender at the same time. So I needed to get a disclosure from this this young person. I'd done it hundreds of times. So, you know, I was there kind of really um, supporting her. And then just something kind of switched in my brain. Um, and I just felt huge overwhelm, um, very emotional, kind of struggling to know what to do or what to say and I was there on my own with her so I had to kind of just somehow get through it which I did I did what I needed to do um, did everything you know that, that I needed to for her got back to the office and just had a complete breakdown really you know complete meltdown um, and just didn't understand what on earth was happening to me um, anyway to cut a long story short I then got referred into our occupational health department and was diagnosed with uh, complex post-traumatic stress, which was linked to my cancer, but also linked to some of the jobs that I dealt with at work. Um, and nobody had ever spoken to me about the fact that PTSD is actually really common for people that have had cancer. Um, and so I then started going, I had EM, something called EMDR treatment, um, where they kind of reprogram your brain to deal with, with trauma in a different way. And it was completely life changing. I had no idea that I'd spent 11, 12 years living a life which I just thought was normal in terms really? of having panic attacks, having flashbacks, all sorts of different things that I just thought I just had to live with. And actually, I didn't. So I came out the other side and kind of just had a real I discovered mindfulness. Um, I had, uh, you know, was kind of given lots of different ideas around looking after myself because I definitely slipped to the bottom of the pile. Mm -hmm. Um and that really ignited my interest in well-being. And from then, I just thought, I really wish I'd known all of this right at the start mm. of my policing career so that I could have looked after myself. And actually, now I just feel like I really want to share this knowledge um, with lots of other people, you know, as many people as I possibly can. So I went on um, work were, were fantastic and sent me on a, um, a residential course to be able to deliver a, a mindfulness in the workplace course. Um, so I did that and that start. I was doing that alongside my main role within the counterterrorism unit. Um, and again, absolutely loved it, loved talking to people about it. Um, and then, as I say, the role came up within the wellbeing team. So I was then able to kind of move across into that and then really start to look at all the different skills that I had and all the different areas of wellbeing and kind of just had a real determination, I guess, to try and make sure that people didn't go through what I went through yeah. in terms of not understanding and not knowing how to look after myself. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, uh, can I just say about that? That normalization is a really interesting thing, isn't it? Um, you know, in the sense that, I mean, obviously, yours is, story is one of quite extreme levels of stress and trauma and all the rest of it. But, you know, we work with people all the time who they've just normalized levels of stress, yeah. you know, even if it's just the thousand emails a day, you know, they just yeah. get to the point where they just think that's normal and then seemingly comes out of the blue when someone really struggles and it's yeah. well no, this has been building, but you've just not you've just not noticed it, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And we, you know, in all the training that I deliver now, I talk to people all the time where I, you know, I'm saying what we really need to be identifying when we're, if you look at the 12 stages of burnout, you know, we need to be looking at it when we're at stage one or two and really just picking up on those subtle signs that are all there, but I certainly had no idea about them. 
Um, whereas at the moment, and it's still very much the case within the police and within um, emergency services in general, I'm sure the trauma is so relentless. You know, frontline officers will be dealing with four, five, six really traumatic incidents potentially in one day and then going to bed and getting up and doing it all again. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it is inevitable, you know, the pressures are so extreme that, yeah, absolutely, we, as you say, we start to normalise it and just think, oh, well, you know, I feel awful, but this is just life. This is how it is. But actually, as you say, there are things that if you pick up on those early signs and work out what your toolkit looks like, what your well-being toolkit looks like, um, you can make a real difference and kind of just, you know, stop yourself um, reaching that kind of final stage of burnout. Yeah, yeah. And that's fascinating. Sorry, I find this so interesting. I was, we were in the first episode of the, the podcast this season, of the podcast, there's a lady we spoke to and she'd also worked in the police as well as part of her career. And, I, and I've done some work in that, in that sector. I find it fascinating how the switch that people have to make between, you know, such a difficult job on the front line and dealing with potentially traumatic things. And also like the, as I would describe, I think I've described this in the other episodes, I won't go through it too much, but you know, this, this mindset that I'm guessing you have to take into a lot of things, it's almost, you know, like a little bit suspicious or like someone's trying to, you know, cause you've not been called for no reason, right? Yeah. <laughs> you've been for yeah. A reason. But then when you go back to the workplace, you can't have that same mindset with your colleagues, your manager, your, you know, but how do you, how do you switch? <laughs> like, how do yeah. You... Well, I tell you it, in my case, in my um, case, and I talk about this now with my children, as I say, because they're adults, my girls, but when they were sort of, uh, you know, 10, 11, and then going into teenage um, years, that was when I was working within that child sexual exploitation world where all I was dealing with, all I was seeing were young people being sexually exploited, being mm. abused, but, you know, all of these. And it was really, really difficult for me to switch off when I came home. Mm. And I became absolutely became very paranoid about my own children mm. and, you know, who they were with and where they were going. And, you know, we kind of can laugh about it now, but they've said that, you know, I did kind of, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't scare them too much, I don't think, but I definitely compared to friends of theirs you know there was definitely an element where I was very much more you know you need to be careful of this where are you going who are you with I, you know who are their parents yeah um and it is very very difficult to you know to switch off but again that is something else that we just weren't taught then you know when you first join the police you know you're kind of there's so much to learn in terms of the law and and procedures and policies etc cetera, etc cetera. But in terms of, as you say, being able to manage that transition from work and home and properly being able to switch off, yeah. we certainly when I joined, we weren't taught that at all. So, again, that's something that I'm trying to change and yeah. really opening up those conversations. Yeah. Yeah, I'm imagining, I've got two young children, I'm imagining you doing background checks at a school party now. <laughs> I wish I could, but we were, yeah. we're not allowed to do that. But that's what I wanted to do, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, Natasha, well, thank you for sharing that um, that personal bit of your of your story. It's amazing, um, really, to think about you know that you've been through those personal things at the same time as managing to build, continue to build your career, which is um, and grow your career, which is one thing that does come up quite a bit in these conversations. Is you know actually the one of the reasons why organizations paying attention this is so important is to be able to keep people moving forward and thriving in their careers and have the resilience even when life you know throws us a bad card and puts us through difficult journeys which inevitably there are those highs and lows aren't there and um yeah it's just amazing to have to know that there's that thought happening which is to make sure that people feel supported through those journeys whilst they're whilst they're at work because so there are still many organizations that are unable to respond to that they might be able to respond to the the challenges and trauma that might come up as a result of the, the what's happening in the workplace um but there is a role to play of for organizations for the stuff that happens outside of work because we're still humans walking through the door each day at the end of the day yeah. um have you found that to be some of the feedback and things that you've heard from people within the um within the, the your workforce you know hearing that they're responding well to the support that the work that you've been driving and your team has been delivering in terms of feeling yeah. supported at home 
Yeah, a hundred percent. And we're still developing um, our support in terms of making sure that we reach out to not just to officers and staff, but to their families as well. So, yeah. you know, for example, um, in terms of their children, understanding that jobs that they do, some of our um, initiatives that we run. So, for example, I run a, an annual virtual wellbeing festival called Wellfest. Mm. And the beauty of that is that we can invite friends and family to sign up to the sessions um, and we run sessions aimed at children. So, for example, we had a virtual visit to a hedgehog hospital or a virtual visit to a zoo, which is aimed at, you know, at families. So, again, what we're saying is that we completely understand that the, you know, that you are coming in and doing a very, very demanding, difficult job every day. And so, actually, we need to look after you, but we need to look after your family as well. Mm -hmm. And we're still kind of, you know, we're still working through that it's, we're definitely not perfect by any stretch of the imagination um but we're definitely when i think how far we've come in the space of four years it's incredible um and also initiatives like we run monthly talk cafes which are effectively online support groups around subjects like bereavement cancer caring responsibilities all sorts of different things and again, what we say is that, you know, family can also join join those those talk groups. So, um, you know, it's another opportunity for us to be able to provide that that support to their family as well. Um, but, yeah, we, as I say, I never thought a few years ago, I never imagined I would be delivering mindfulness courses yeah. um, within the police. Um, but it, the last course I ran, I had 110 um, officers and staff wow. um, request to come on the course. So it's just incredible, really, that, you know, when I first started talking about mindfulness, I felt like a, a you know, a little bit of a weirdo, basically. <laughs> People were looking at me like I had two heads because this was all just a bit weird. And now everybody's embracing it. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, just... Extending that, some... sorry, I was going to say, extending that support to the family and friends is, or family more so is, is, is really, really interesting. Uh, something that you don't see a lot, for yeah. example, in the private sector, I wouldn't have said. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's some... another another example of the initiative. So Oscar Kilo is our national police wellbeing service that's funded by the government. They've um, they're recently kind of looking at a package of support for family um, as well as a package of support for people retiring. Um, and one of the examples they've um, uh, a, an organization called Police Care have designed a book, um, a children's book, which basically explains about some of the things that as a police officer that you might do. But in with fantastic, you know, pictures and visuals, but it also explained, obviously, aimed at children. Mm. Um, and again, the feedback we've had. So we've we've been able to purchase those. And when we go around and visit stations, we can kind of hand those out. And that's another example of something that, again, the feedback has been that it's, it's really, really helpful to be able to have. It just enables those conversations between parents and children. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Um, just whilst we were sort of you mentioned a few sort of practical examples of things that you've done um, and delivered. Um, can I ask a couple more questions about that just whilst we're whilst we're on it? Um, so you mentioned before about the leads and the different, I guess that looks different in different forces, um, different yeah. divisions. So um, is there any sort of formal network? Like do you have a monthly call, online call with that network of people or anything like that? Or is there um, red, like mandatory training for those people or anything like that? So, yeah, we have... Um, a number of different forums. So, for example, I'm part of a national men's health forum. I'm part of a, a national menopause um, group. Right. Um, um, and there are a number of other initiatives kind of along those lines where, where um, representatives from either well-being and it does vary because, as I say, the structures of all 43 police forces are completely different. You know, you know, they are everyone. It's it's frustrating at times police forces do tend to work in silos so mm. it's really refreshing to be able to get onto a platform where we can all share and and you know as I say for example again Wellfest I can then say look this is open to all UK police forces so I'm organizing it but actually it's online you know everybody's welcome so um, yeah the National Men's Health Forum is another really good example where again all the leads from the, the men's health groups um, and they won't necessarily be working full time within well-being, but they will just have taken on that role in terms of just wanting to develop stuff around men's health. Um, so, yeah, they they exist and, and, and work really well. The menopause one is another is another good example. Yeah. You know, again, it's 
the work that we've done around menopause over the last few years um, is is uh, really, really kind of leading the way mm. in terms of the support that we're able to offer staff. And and again, I never thought we'd be talking about menopausal symptoms or, you know, within meetings mm. within within the police. It's just a massive cultural shift. Yeah, amazing. So you've got stuff coming from occupational health, stuff coming from Oscar Kilo, which is the government's police support yeah. wellbeing programme, and then activity coming from wellbeing leads. Is that kind of how it looks that's it yeah yeah that's certainly within our force that's how it looks we work alongside occupational health yeah um so that we've got an occupational health department but we've got one um of the lead nurses that we link in with so if we've got any particular um cases that that we're dealing with that we're really worried about or that we know have been referred into occupational health and they haven't heard anything or you know whatever it may be then we can contact occupational health and, and flag it um, and then adversely, um, we recently more so now that, again, as more as we become more established and kind of um, have developed our skills, occupational health can provide clinical support. And then right. maybe when it gets to the end of that clinical support, they're then feeling like they just need kind of some more support around their well-being. So occupational health will then refer into us and we can then pick them up. We've got a, re a fantastic peer support network. So we've got well over 100 staff across the um, three counties that have signed up to be a peer supporter. So they've been on a, a two day course. And it's it's you know they're effectively being a friendly listening ear. It's not counselling, mm -hmm. but they're just someone that have got a shared experience, and we link them up together. Yeah. Um, and that network works really really well as yeah. well. And so you mm -hmm. call them peer supporters. Peer supporters, peer yeah, supporters. yeah, like, yeah. Amazing. Okay, all right. Well, back to you then. Um, what do you think the best bits are about the role that you do? Um. The best bits are definitely being able to connect with other people. Um, and I had a really lovely um, conversation with um, a lady last week. So I delivered um, a talk sometime last year about my own personal journey and my own personal experience. Um, and um, that was probably about six months ago. And then I spoke to someone last week um, in a Teams meeting about something completely different. And she said, I just want to say I am so grateful that you shared your story because I um, am currently going through a relationship breakdown mm. and kind of you talking about the fact that you've been through that and that you've then met someone else and kind of, you know, she said, it, I just found it really inspiring. And it's it's kind of just given me the strength to think, you know, that that there there is kind of life on the other side. And again, in terms of my own cancer journey, um, being able to share that and say, look, you know, look, this is it is horrendous. It's horrific facing that. Mm. Um, but to be able to, again, say, you know, this is how I was then and this is how I am now. I can talk about it without breaking down in tears. Um, and, you know, so, again, it's kind of just being able to connect with people and um, and kind of, you know, provide that support to them. I just absolutely love it. Yeah. Mm. Really. But also it's very rare within the police that you're in a role that, where you can be creative. Yeah. Because um, mm. obviously most of our jobs are very process driven. You know, something happens and there is a very clear guide. You know, there are very clear guidelines around how you respond to that. Whereas in this role, we, you know, we've got fantastic support from senior managers to just sort of say, look, you know, if you want to try something, then try it, give it a go and let's see if it works. So we can come up with all sorts of different creative ideas. And we've got such a, a great team. We've, we've all got different skills. Um, and so we've, you know, we've been able to go off and do that and be creative, um, which I never imagined I'd be able to do within my role as a police officer. So I love that. Yeah, I, I love that as well. I, I love that idea of creativity. I talk a lot about that, <laughs> about mm, this idea yeah. of all boring Alethea with talk about human-centered design, right? And uh, yeah. that, the idea is because we don't have a, a playbook or a prescription for this stuff. It's not just no. do these three things and suddenly no one's stressed and their well-being's optimized the whole day. It just doesn't yeah. exist. Like, if no. it did, we'd be doing it. <laughs> if it did, yeah. we'd be doing it. But, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and work out what those things might look like for different people at different times. And that's where the creativity mm -hmm. comes in. I think the key, and I think you've, you've talked about this, is putting the human being at the centre of that creativity. You know, yeah. it's not just, you know, if uh, yeah, if I was going to be a bit harsh, sometimes, sometimes I see the creativity come out from like almost just the tech angle. Like, 
what's some cool tech that's creative that we could use and i think have you actually checked whether people want that and <laughs> whether mm-hmm. it fits the needs and and all the rest of it sometimes it will sometimes it will. i'm not i'm not discounting tech as a useful thing in the well-being space but you know i think that you need to put humans at the center of that creativity yeah i completely agree and it's interesting because we've had just this conversation recently where i kind of feel like i'm a little bit apt out um there's an app for everything isn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. um and and as you say they absolutely have a place and they are really really helpful but i'm moving much more towards um you know especially now we're you know we're back in that space where we can organize in-person conferences and um and just we have such a, we've got eight thousand staff as i mentioned um from all different backgrounds doing so many different jobs that it absolutely is never going to be a one size fits all it's never even going to be a 10 size fits all you know we've got to constantly be evolving and thinking about new ways and thinking you know that okay well that works for that group of people but actually you know there's another group of people down in you know the far end of Cornwall who who need something completely different so um and also um the topics um you know you the the topics are kind of endless around the you know the the support that we that we need to be offering um and a lot of them are really sensitive you know we had i had a conversation recently with a lady um who had, um you know horrifically lost a baby Mm-hmm. And she had come back to work and felt completely alone. Her line manager was struggling to know what to say. Her colleagues didn't know what to say to her. Occupational health could offer some support, but it wasn't really particularly specialist. Mm-hmm. And I delivered some training. She ended up coming and speaking to me um, and we had a really long conversation. So then I've pulled together as a result of that, a whole load of support around signposting Mm. to charities externally. We've set up a talk cafe so that she can link in with other people who've been through that experience. Um, And, uh, you know, and it's really powerful because then, as I say, the biggest thing is that she then doesn't feel so alone and there is nothing worse, is there? So, um, So, yeah, that constantly evolving and coming up with different creative ideas is so important and that, but that's a perfect example of that you, you put that that individual's need at the center and then you've created a potential yeah. solution off the back of it which by the way will go and help lots of other people as well yeah. but it started with the person rather than which app can we purchase yeah exactly <laughs> you know? um, exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and i've spoken i've met some really lovely people for us from some charities right across the country that I've linked in with now who are going to come and deliver some training for us some training for managers around how to support people that have been through that because it's so common but we just don't talk about it because it's just too uncomfortable isn't it but again we've got to make sure that you know you would think within the police we should we should and we are very skilled at having difficult conversations because we have to do that all the time and support people in their darkest moments but then when it's it's interesting then when it's within our organization some people kind of then really struggle with it because it's you know you're kind of in a in a different world if you like um and so they then are then worrying about am i going to say the right thing you know should i say that what is that support and as you know, as we've uh, I discussed with this with this lady, um, you know, it didn't matter if someone said the wrong thing. She mm. just wanted someone to talk to her and, mm. you know, and to say, I'm here if you want to go and grab a cup of tea, you know, something mm. as simple as that. Um, but we I completely accept that we do need to provide line managers with some skills and knowledge around some of these really difficult topics so that they do feel empowered to go and, you know, and offer that that support. Yeah. 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 So, sorry, Alicia, do you mind if I, I've got, okay. I've just got one more. Yeah. I just want to pull that through just a tiny bit more just because, so I attended, we, we were talking just before we, we, we started recording, Natasha and I, we both attended the, um, the health and wellbeing yeah. conference last, last week in, in Birmingham, last week, week before, time flies. Yeah, um, I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know either. Um, but, um, one of the, one of the talks that I went to that was really interesting, what was about, um, social determinants and their impacts on well-being. So basically, heavy hitting stuff that's going on outside of the workplace, such as you know COVID and the war in Ukraine and Israel and Palestine. You know these like heavy subjects that can be quite polarizing, quite divisive. And the question was, should we be talking about those things in the workplace, or you know, how do we talk about those things in the workplace? Because 
it doesn't seem like a good idea to just bottle that up if some people have got some really right. strong views on those just to bottle it up and avoid it but then the question is like how how do you create those spaces to have constructive conversations where it doesn't trigger negative responses in people and then i there's a, you know I've, I've maybe made a bit of a jump there but you're talking about some really serious you know subjects there and it's how do you set up the forums and do you need oh I'll, I'll ask you the question do you need like rules around it or do you think it's just how do you do yeah. that yeah i mean i think certainly whenever we run anything like that and and i've got a couple of sort of quite difficult conversations to have um sort of over the next few months around different topics and but we just always sort of say you know that number one confidentiality is really important that people feel um you know and i'm sure it'd be the same for most people that everything is always confidential unless we think someone's life is at risk or a crime has been committed um um, but other than that, people have to feel safe. Mm. Um, I also think that, um, you know, being able to properly connect with someone in whatever way. So you don't necessarily have had to have been through that exact experience. But if you really empathize with mm. someone, you connect with something within them, don't you? So, again, mm. to kind of make that clear at the beginning that it doesn't matter if you want to cry. And this is a big one. I say this to people all the time. You know, people come into our bereavement talk cafe or the cancer talk cafe and they'll start talking about something and start crying and then immediately apologize and we do that all the time don't we mm. and again I'm trying to sort of say look it doesn't matter this is the space where you're absolutely okay to cry um, and you know if it's a virtual space I always sort of say you know I wish I could give you a hug mm. um, but I'm kind of sending you a virtual hug um, and and yeah I think just kind of acknowledging that uh, as well that we all have different opinions we all have kind of different views because of our own personal journeys mm -hmm. everything you know we've all got stuff that's gone on that nobody else will know about so again being really respectful and listening properly listening to other people um and acknowledging that you know that difference is also really important yeah that's it that's really good yeah. advice yeah yeah and that li that listening message is so important isn't it because everyone's journey and experience even if it's something very like, rare like you know baby loss then it's it's important that they feel like there's something in place for them especially when there's things in yeah. place for others um but yeah. I do you feel like that is where a lot of organizations really struggle understandably because you know there's just so many different things isn't there huge really? yeah. so many different topics and themes to be talking about but um you know we need to be there for the handful of people as much as we do the the masses uh, well well done I was actually going to ask and I think creativity helps to cover it but I was going to ask how do you manage all of the different spectrum of different things that you do talk about and do address because that is one thing I'm always kind of blown away about is you know the the long list of things that you're paying attention to and talking to talking about with your organization and then sharing on LinkedIn a lot <laughs> yeah it is a lot and sometimes I kind of sort of think I do feel like my head's gonna you know going to explode a bit there are uh, but I just think it's so important and I was I just really don't want like you said I don't want anyone to feel that they aren't being listened to or that their needs yeah. aren't being thought about there are times definitely when I have to say to people um, so, you know, for, we've also, as an example, we've got, we run an endometriosis talk cafe. Yeah. Um, and again, endometriosis is something that isn't really yeah. talked about. People really don't understand unless you, you know, you've been impacted yourself. Um, and then as a result of that, we've then have, I've had other people come and say, you know, I've experienced something else, you know, similar. Um, but we can't obviously start a talk cafe on every single one yeah. because otherwise we would, you know, it would just never end. So we just have to try and bring them under that umbrella and just say, look, you know, there would be people in here that maybe haven't got exactly the same experience, but that doesn't matter. You know, you can still have conversations around that. Um, and I think just also, um, I, well, um, networking has just been hugely important and again that's why I haven't actually I've only been on LinkedIn probably for a couple of years I think not that long it was completely alien to me before but I really value it in terms of the networking um, I get contacted by a lot of people not that I, I can't 
you know, often respond to everyone, but it's just been fantastic in terms of, like you say, I definitely don't have the knowledge around every single area. So to be able to network and identify someone and bring them in and say, you know, okay, can you provide this talk? Um, and it might not be an ongoing thing. It might be just something within Wellfest or it might be something within yeah. Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, but that networking and bringing in other skills and knowledge is just so, so important um, because, yeah, as, as you say, we can then make sure that we cover a whole variety of topics. Um, and also, as I say, we're very lucky um, in Devon, Cornwall and Dorset that we've got this small team of us. So we've all got different areas that we lead on. Okay. Um, if it was just me on my own, like it is in some forces, there's absolutely no way I'd be able to, you know, we'd be able to look at every single topic as we do. Um, so again, that really highlights the importance of that investment from organisations and, and companies. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I just want to acknowledge something that you said just before when you were talking about like how, how this works is um, also just that the importance of there's the support for the individuals who might be experiencing it, but there's also the training of everyone. So all of these topics are relevant to everyone, right? Because it's all about building empathy and people having get, have, being educated and having an understanding. Um, I often think that about, you know, like even just menstrual cycles, like something that every woman in a workplace is experiencing. And let's face it, it's not particularly fun. There's like the highs and the lows. And it comes out yeah. every single month and we have to deal with yeah. that. Um, and actually, you know, one thing that we could do with having is a little bit more kind of empathy um, from everyone in the workplace around that journey. Because we don't choose for it to be the journey that it is. It just it is what it is. So, um, yeah, 100%. Yeah. And I had a really great conversation with one of our um, executive officers. Um, uh, she's police staff. She's called Alexis Paul. She's one of our assistant chief officers. And um, we had a great conversation on the back of um, a session that ran during Wellfest last year it was around men um, menstruation yeah. and kind of how it impacts on the workplace. And it really opened up a conversation. And she said, you know, we need to be more comfortable to sit yeah. in a room full of men, which we often that's yeah. often the case and say, do you know what? I'm really not OK today because it's that time of the month yeah. for me. And, you know, I'm really struggling. So, you know, I maybe need to shift a particular project or a meeting or whatever until mm -hmm. next week when I'll be feeling a lot better. So, again, yeah. to just have those conversations and also, in again, in our organisation, practical things like officers being out on scene cordons, mm -hmm. on scene guards um, for hours and hours and mm -hmm. hours at a time. And the impact that that might have, you know, depending on if it is, you know, if it is that, that time in their cycle. Mm -hmm. So it's also those practical things that, again, we absolutely need to address and feel more comfortable talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Being yeah, absolutely. Culture, right? Something like uniform, Be right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The uniform, the, you know, again, making sure that they have access to toilets, um, yeah. all things that you kind of sort of think that's fairly basic. But actually, in a lot of circumstances, it hasn't been it hasn't been addressed before. Um, yeah. So we are much better at that now, kind of looking and making sure that as part of any major incident or anything that is going on that involves female officers, you know, uniform, again, is another big thing. We still incredibly uh, really struggle to get well-fitting trousers for women yeah. um, who are on the front line because they're all designed for men mm -hmm. um, it's it's incredible but it is something else there's a there's a we have a working group looking at women's uniform we've got a women's network um, and that's one of the issues they're looking at, at trying to improve that um, yeah. which again you kind of sort of think we're in 2024 should we not have looked at that a long time ago but it doesn't matter we're looking at it now so yeah. that's all good yeah, yeah. and that, that's a piece about baking Bake it. I, I like this phrase, but like baking well-being into all the decisions that you make. Because pretty yeah. much, uh, again, I, I feel like I'm biased around this, but any decision in the workplace, near enough, if it involves yeah. people, which the vast majority do, there's a well-being angle to it, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. 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 From the really little decisions to the big strategic ones. So. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and I've got to say again, there are most, as far as I'm aware, most. Well, certainly any major incident. Um, so, again, as an example, um, and this is all still fairly new, when we had the tragic uh, mass shooting in Plymouth um, a couple of years ago, um, absolutely horrific circumstances. Um, and obviously, from a police perspective, all of the things were put in place 
immediately you know everything kind of with their policies and procedures that that need to be followed but one of the things that they also did immediately was call on the well-being team we got um one of the national police well-being vans the oscar kilo vans mm. brought down from lancashire um within a few hours and um to myself and someone else in our team were down there you know really early in the morning on the inner cordon with the van providing support and well-being support to not only the officers who were scene guarding um but also the crime scene cleaners um the witnesses who were there that we were providing support to everybody you know there's so many people involved in it um and that was all that all happened immediately so as you say even in every single decision absolutely well-being is such a key yeah. part of that yeah. Wow, yeah. that's that's an amazing resource. You can almost imagine something like that being useful at a lot of, you know, incidents and, you know, like an ambulance, but for well-being, right? Like, yes. Look yeah, after everyone. Yeah. And we do have, we also, not, not long ago, um, the Federation, the Police Federation have bought a Federation van, which again has got like, you know, tea and coffee making facilities um, and, you know, all of that kind of thing. So yeah. that's one locally. Um, which we can also utilise. So, yeah, absolutely, it's really important. Yeah, I've met, I've met that team. I've spent some time over in Lancashire yeah. and uh, yeah, saw the vans and spoke to the Oscar Kilo ah. team and all the rest of it because it's not far yeah. from me. It's not far from where oh, I live, really. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, Lisa, and oh. we're, we're kind of nearly out of time we now. We are. I do. I've, got one, I've yeah, got one go more question. It. And um, it was around the skills that you feel that you draw upon in yourself um you know you we obviously talked about um creativity and you're clearly incredibly um hard working and resilient um but what else you know just generally speaking what what's useful for someone taking on this challenge um, well i would say um definitely i've talk, spoken about empathy but definitely that empathy and compassion yeah. is really really important and I don't yeah. think you can do this job unless you've got a really strong sense of empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. um, and I do also think that it's really important to be willing to be vulnerable about your own lived experience, because every single one of us has got something that, that mm -hmm. we faced. You know, some people, obviously, it's 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 quite extreme for others. It, it doesn't matter. But to be willing to actually say that, look, this is when I was really struggling and this is what I noticed. And this is the these are some of the signs and symptoms that, that were there for me. Um, to be willing to be vulnerable is really, really important. Um, and I think um, also to just be willing to be continually um, learning. You know, we need there are there are so many different tools out there. Um, and that's why, again, and that's why I love networking with people, because everyone you speak to, you can take something away from them. Um, you know, from from what they've said or or from what they've shared. Um, so yeah, I absolutely love that. You know, being able to meet different people. Um, and yeah, as I say, just that compassion, empathy, creativity. And you also, I think the other key thing is um, being able to recognize when you do need to take a step back. So there are absolutely mm -hmm. times around sort of compassion fatigue and even secondary trauma in terms of a lot of the things that I'm listening to all the time that I recognize that as much as I want to just keep going and going and going and saying yes to everything, mm -hmm um you've got to be good at saying actually you know my cup is full my bucket is full and I just need to take a step back for a bit um and you know look after me mm -hmm. and then I'll be okay to go again you know and again it's that kind of recognizing that much earlier than I ever used to mm -hmm. yeah that is a big thing, thing for this role isn't it like keeping your, yeah keeping your own self-care yeah in check and knowing your own boundaries and things yeah what do you do for your own self-care um i have recently started playing pickleball oh yes. nice. um so everyone who normally kind of goes what i've never heard of pickleball so it is it's huge in the us um they've got stadiums where they play yeah. pickleball um but we have it at our local tennis club it's basically a cross between table tennis and tennis mm. and it's just really good fun it's really great again for connecting with lots of lovely people so I definitely do that but the biggest one is definitely my dog oh, um God. who I I I, know, I share lots about Murphy on LinkedIn yeah. but he is um he is definitely he makes me smile every single day 
um, and I just I'm lucky to live literally just down the road from the beach so I go to the beach as often as I can and in the woods and yeah that for me is my if I if I've had a bad day I go out just completely switch off and just focus on Murphy and you, I just can't help but smile I just <laughs> adore him oh amazing so how do we check out you and Murphy on LinkedIn <laughs> <laughs> so yeah natasha hill if you just yeah. search, search for me on on linkedin natasha hill um and yeah i'm more than happy to kind of connect yeah, with people and, and link in, in in any way i can yeah perfect yeah so um well that was amazing thank you natasha for sharing Thanks, all of that i feel like that's a really nice note to sort of wrap things up unless there's anything that you've got to ask matt no, no, yeah. good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, right. Well, thank you so much, Natasha. Really have appreciated your time and congratulations on all of the amazing work that you do. Um, it really is incredible. Um, and I definitely recommend everyone follows Natasha on LinkedIn because it's, yeah, it's a very inspirational journey um, that you're having there. So, um, yeah, we'll look forward to chatting to you again sometime soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's been really lovely. Thanks, Natasha. <laughs> Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Bye.